delighted to be part of this conversation. I've given it a lot of thought. You know, this concept of trust is so deep and, and, and it goes to the core to, you, you kind of feel it in your, in, in your, in the deepest part of your being, but also in the deepest part of communities. Um, as an organization, the YWCA has been around for 162 years and truly our hallmark is that we hold the trust of communities. Um, you can find people in communities all across the country who will tell you stories of their grandmothers or their parents who went to the YWCA for a variety of services. And they have those great memories and it really rings true to generations. Um, that is something you don't package and you don't put in a shelf. That's something that is deep in the psychology of communities. And the reason why it's seeped into the psychology of communities is because there are very fond memories of being taken care of. Mm. And I think that's the anchor of trust. Mm. When you know that someone has your back, when you know that someone is there for you. And COVID really brought that to bear. Um, as, as we talked during the preparation for this discussion, we didn't have the luxury to turn our backs. Um, for many may not know about the YWCA, we do everything from childcare, after school program, workforce development. Yes, we still have pools, but we like to say that not all YWCAs have pools, but we help women when they feel like they're drowning. We are the largest providers of uh, services of, for domestic violence survivors. So during COVID, mm -hmm. our services were needed more than ever because it skyrocketed. So just to, to wrap up, COVID really brought to bear that organizations like YWCA, um, we didn't have the luxury to, to shut our doors. We had to continue to serve our communities. We turned our child care into child cares for first responders. So being present in the times of most need is what engenders that trust. And that is something that we hold very dear because once you forego trust, it is ho so hard to, break, to regain it. So I'm looking forward to going deeper into this conversation. Yeah, well, there's just so much to, to build on what you're saying there, Alejandra. You know, at, at Citizen University, um, we're, we're a nonprofit based in Seattle. We do work all around the United States. And our work is fundamentally about trying to build a culture of powerful, responsible citizenship. Um, and I hasten to add, when we talk about citizenship and citizen university, we're not talking about documentation status. We mean the broader ethical sense uh, that you all embody of just being a member of the body, a member of the community, contributing to the life of that community. And, um, you know, we really emphasize the culture side uh, of this work because, um, you know, for all that is happening right now in this incredible time of both upheaval and I think opportunity um, around racial justice and social justice, um, there's a lot of emphasis properly on structural change, policy and elections and, uh, and so forth. Um, but we also believe that culture is upstream of structure, that the norms, the values, the relationships, the trust, the habits that we form with each other or fail to form with each other, that creates the context out of which policy ends up happening, right? Uh, and when you throw in something like the pandemic, it accelerates the ways in which either trust or the lack of trust um, can come to a uh, can come to fruition or come to a boil, right? And so our programs at Citizen University um, are fundamentally about trying to build bonds of trust and affection. We actually use that term, um, you know. And you know, another word for affection is love, mm -hmm. right? Civic love. Uh, and so we have programs that, uh, for instance, probably our best known program is called Civic Saturdays, uh, and these are gatherings that are essentially a civic analog to a faith gathering. Uh, you know, it's not church, it's not synagogue or mosque, but uh, uh, but it has the arc and the flow and the feel of one, uh, and its emphasis is instead on the creed of ideas and ideals that we here in the United States profess to believe in, but have never actually fully lived up to, right? Um, and so what does it mean to gather and to challenge ourselves to live up to that creed? What does it mean to take seriously the idea of liberty and justice for all, equal protection of the laws, right? Um, that's a perpetual American challenge uh, but I think uh, just in these last couple of months, with the combination of the pandemic and the incredible uh, uprisings that have, that have arisen since George Floyd's murder, um, you know, people are realizing not only that there's been a perpetual gap between our creed and our deeds, but that it's time now to close that gap, right? 
And so Civic Saturday is our one such program. We have a civic seminary where we train people from communities all around the country, small towns and rural areas, big cities, uh, to lead Civic Saturday gatherings where they live. Um, we're launching a civic confirmation program uh, that is going to be kind of extending the whole framework, um, creating an arc of, uh, of, of civic and moral formation uh, for high school students guided by an elder, um, akin to a religious confirmation or a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah uh, process. Um, and in all of these programs, uh, the watchword really is trust. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that um, really connects our work is the sense that, um, yeah, you have to think about things at a societal scale. You go to, you know, YWCA's website and it's all about ending racism, right? Which is not, <laughs> not, not a small task. Uh, and I think, you know, for us, building a culture of powerful, responsible citizenship, you don't do these things by waving a wand, by having big leaders uh, say, it's, say it ought to be so. These things happen bottom up and middle out. They happen from the inside out, right? From our own personal uh, capacity for transformation and the way in which, in the best sense, we can make that contagious, right? And so, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, your organization is 160 plus years old, uh, um, but it also grew, as we've talked about, it, it, it has, of course, um, origins in faith communities and faith models of organizing people, right? Um, obviously, the YWCA, like the YMCA today, is open to people of all faiths and, and no particular godly faith. Uh, but those structures, those bones still matter. Giving people a place to make meaning together. Giving people a safe a place. I wrote this down when you said to create memories of care. Mm -hmm. What you said about the why and why, why to be saying why it matters, like memories of care, memories of belonging, right? Um, you all have a deep, tried and true structure for doing that. And with programs like Civic Saturday, we're trying to reanimate uh, such deep rituals and structures for people to find each other again. And I, I want to quote you because when you and I talked uh, as we prepared, and I know that many folks are probably going to say, why are they continuing to reference that? It's because we had such a lively conversation just to get ready for this conversation. Yeah. And I wish so many of the participants were in that, in that original discussion. <laughs> um, but you said something very powerful. You said democracy requires a deep wellspring of beliefs challenging of each other what do we take seriously and i i really love that those questions because you know for the ywca the mission statement of eliminating racism and empowering women is not new you know in the in in this moment in time people may say oh you you may have just picked it up no we we tack we picked that up you know, since 1946, we became the first racially integrated organization. And it was Dorothy Heights who brought this one imperative, recognizing that we had to have this intersectionality of race and gender. When it was really unpopular, uncomfortable, now, indeed, we have to take this conversation up. But those are the issues that we as an organization hold, you know, hold true. And we fight every day, even when it's not in front of the cameras, when it's not in front of the philanth you know, the funders. Today, it's a little easier because it is in the public eye and it should be. But this is the work that we hold true and that we will continue to hold true. So I, I like this conversation, Eric, because even though there is, and some people may not like it, there is a, a, a resonance of a religious context, it really isn't. It's about humanity. What do we hold to be sacred and true about humanity? What anchors us? So for us, rituals about being coming in communities, we're, we touch 1,300 communities across the country. This is a type of model that you can't replicate. And also, we, we fight for those issues that are coming down the pike that are coming down the horizon, that people are not really looking at it, but because we have the finger on the pulse, we're paying attention to it. How is AI going to be the next racial justice battle that we all have to figure out? So this is the beauty of being part of a community, Give, getting those telltale signs and then fighting as hard as you can. You now, I really want to lean into something you, you, you said a moment ago, Alejandro, which is you know, the, the idea of belief. Right. And just to be really clear in all our work at Citizen University and what you're describing at the YWCA, you know, we are not talking about, um, you know, godly religion. We're talking about what you might think of as American civic religion. 
um, which is to say that democracy, this whole experiment, this fragile thing we call democracy, um, flies entirely on the power of belief. Democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works, right? And, and, and once enough of us stop believing it, you realize just how completely evanescent the whole thing is, right? It's kind of like money. Like we all kind of mutually agree that, that money, that a piece of green paper ought to mean something, right? Uh, and when you see in different times in history or different societies, when people stop believing that and it's just a worthless piece of paper, oh wow, like that whole thing is completely fragile, right? And so belief in the idea of that this thing can be legitimate, belief in the idea that this thing can actually work for us, belief in each other, belief that you might see me and you might hear me and you might recognize me in my full human dignity, as you say, right? And what is to me beautiful about even so much of the pain that's being expressed right now in our society is that it is still a measure, cries of pain are still a measure of belief, mm -hmm. right? Silence, resignation, just completely checking out, that to me would signal kind of the evaporation um, of this civic faith, right? But when people are still angry enough to get out and protest, still angry enough to risk exposure to COVID, uh, to join in marches, still impassioned enough uh, to say, we can't wait any longer, this is the time, and I'm willing to risk my job, my reputation, my whatever, my friendships, to name things as they are. Um, you know, these are expressions of this deep, deep, uh, what John Dewey called democratic faith. This idea that if I show up, I can actually make the thing work for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now, showing up doesn't make it so. That alone doesn't do it. Uh, um, and, and that's why both of us, both at the YWCA and at Citizen University, you know, a lot of what we teach in addition to just how to deal with people who are different from you and talk about what it means to live up to the American idea, we also straight up teach power. Uh, we, we have a lot of programs and workshops that are just about democratizing understanding of what power is and how it works, right? Because um, when you think that power is just this thing over there that other people have and other people use and they use it against you and it's dirty and you don't want to touch it, um, then you're just giving up your own voice preemptively. You're just handing your power over to somebody else. And so, um, you know, a lot of what we try to do is to remind people wherever you sit, no matter how rigged the game feels right now, uh, you are more powerful than you think. Uh, and when we come in twos, threes, fives, tens, you know, not alone, basically, um, we can activate power in a new way. And that to me has always been the power um, of the institutional rituals and models that you all have been practicing for, you know, decades and, you know, century and a half at the YWCA. I want to take the conversation back to the report because I know that independent sector partnered with Edelman on, on this trust report. What I found fascinating, you know, um, wh when you look at the NGOs, we have a higher trust um, uh, index, so to speak, um, because we're perceived ethical, which I'm so delighted to see. Um, obviously, compared to philanthropy, we, we stand, we're, we're much higher. And yet, um, they, uh, people don't see us as competent, um, which I found interesting. And I, and I, and I want to push back on that because I would love to have a conversation with the Edelman group. You know, we are competent in so many different ways because we stand, we fill the gap that the public sector fails to address, that the private sector doesn't think it has to address, and that philanthropy, if it's flashy enough, shiny enough, interesting enough, maybe, they'll think about it. So the, the, the NGO space is one of those spaces where we're doing it because not of the present payoff, but because we see the long-term payoff. You know, the work that you do um, is, is not about the today right now. It's because you understand that you have to make that investment right now. And whether or not we find the funders, it you know, we're going to do the work no matter what. We're going to figure it out. Yeah. So in terms of innovation, ingenuity, urgency, I, you know, I push back on that trust report. We're competent yeah. beyond belief. I, so I'm with you. I'm so with you on that, you know, and I think, you know, there's two sides to that equation. One, that there's this negative stereotype of a lot of nonprofits and NGOs as, you know, not efficient, not competent. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it that's equally wrong is this idea that 
everybody in the private sector is efficient and competent. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. If you've worked 10 minutes in the private sector, you know that's kind of not true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the realities is that, you know, in, in our sector, in the nonprofit world, you know, so much of what has to happen is, as you say, long term. And so much of it is about, um, you know, the, the infrastructure of the human heart. Right. It's about relationships and about that trust and about um, maybe making people feel they belong. And sometimes that's not easily measurable. Right. Sometimes you don't have immediate metrics uh, for that. But um, I think one of the things that history teaches us is that every time there's been a big shift in moral norms, every time there's been a big uh, social reform and inclusion movement, um, it happened not led by the private sector, uh, not led necessarily by big big dollar philanthropists, it happened because on the ground, you know, what Alexis de Tocqueville called little platoons of people gathering, figuring stuff out, right? Maybe some of them are organized as 501c3s. Maybe some of them are just circles of neighbors um, deciding to show up and pull together and say, hey, we, we got to deal with this. Hey, we got to talk to each other uh, about this, right? And, um, and I think that work is so foundational. And I think, you know, it's actually, uh, it was very interesting to have Dharma um, open uh, today with that extended spoken word piece about the power of art uh, to transform civic and political life. Uh, because with art, as is often the case with uh, many dimensions of nonprofit work, um, you know, sometimes people who are very metrics obsessed will say, well, that's the soft stuff, right? That, that's nice to have, but that's the soft stuff. And, uh, and I submit to you, like, I, I, there is no change without the quote unquote soft stuff. Right, Correct. Correct. <laughs> the heart and the blood that courses through that's soft stuff, Correct. right? And uh, and and I think what we've got to we've got to have the courage of our convictions that um, sure there's got to be accountability. We've got to account for the dollars we spend in a nonprofit. You know, we have we do have our metrics of how many people served, how many people you've uh, helped in domestic violence situations, how many people we're training to lead Civic Saturdays how many young people we reach in our youth collaboratory program, all that is great. And we, we all have nice annual reports about that kind of stuff. Um, but you're talking about something deeper, which is um, recognizing that this is a relational business. Actually, business is the wrong word. This is a relational body of work, just the same way that democracy at the end of the day is a relational body of work. And it's not episodic. It has to be a continuum. It doesn't just happen every four years. It doesn't happen just when it's convenient or when you're, you know, fed up or, or when you feel that the system is rigged. It has to be a continuum. Um, Eric, I know I, I promised that I was going to be a bit of, a, of the uh, traffic in, in terms of the question. You have a question in the Q&A, and I have, and I see two, two questions regarding racial justice. If you don't mind, I want to tackle the issues regarding racial justice because um, the, it, it does go deep into trust. Um, and, and again, um, I told Dan uh, that I, I was going to be very honest. I'm a New Yorker, so I, I try to put all my cards on the table. Um, you know, this is, a, this is an incredible moment. It, it, it really is an incredible moment. And yes, there can be moments when you feel a little skeptical. Uh, one of the comments was, we've heard this before. In the 60s, we had this movement, we had this momentum, and then the promise wasn't delivered. I, I, I understand that, and I, I, you know, I, feel, I feel at times that. But I also feel that this is somewhat different. You know, it's amazing to see the young energy, the creativity, how social media as a, as a technological tool has been able to you know, it's, it's, it's galvanized. It's, it's been that catalyst where no matter where you go, I'm, I'm right now in, in, in Florida, uh, epicenter of COVID, not, not yeah. the smartest thing, but my mother's here. So it, it, to see what has occurred in this moment in time is really amazing. And I want to hold on to the hope because trust and hope go hand in hand. Now, there's a question that's very, very uh, provoking, and I'm trying to behave, which is, which is what about co corporations that are using um, this moment in time for PR and organizations? I think the question goes more to what are your thoughts on organizations that are using the racial justice climate for PR purposes with zero intention of making tangible systemic changes within their organization? You know, that's where community and individuals must 
you know, hold them accountable. Yes. It's hard. It's not yeah. easy. But you know what? We have to pierce through it. Yeah. And, and again, I hold our organization. We are an organization eliminating racism and empowering women. We are going through our own process. How do we hold up racial justice? Is it perfect? No. But our intentions are there. The work that we do is there. Do we now need to revisit our racial justice work and go deeper? Because you've said it before, this work is iterative. Every day you have to challenge yourself, push yourself, go deeper and deeper and deeper because no single day will give you that perfect answer. So I want to invite those who are on this panel to think about, look, let's not, use, let's not lose hope and let's not let cynicism get deep, uh, seep into it, but we have to push. We have to push ourselves, our organizations, and other organizations so that the, the corporations and others don't use this moment as a simple PR. Yeah. That's if we fail to do that, then we fail as a democratic to, to leverage our democratic voice. You know, I, I think there's two things I, I really want to um, highlight here. One is to, to your point, that kind of relentless iterative persistence, right? Correct. Um, and holding institutions, whether they're private sector corporations doing nice PR stuff or, you know, uh, or other institutions, elected officials, whatever. Um, holding them to account, right? I mean, at the same time, to, you know, to uh, use a phrase from like poker or something, pocket your gains too, right? I mean, it, it is kind of remarkable that, you know, every major corporation, all the sports leagues now have turned on a dime and are now out there saying Black Lives Matter, right? I'm a baseball guy, right? Major League Baseball, which is the whitest of the professional sports leagues, you know, two weeks ago, every, all 30 of the general managers just did Instagrams, you know, holding a placard that said Black Lives Matter. Not thinkable six months ago, not thinkable six weeks ago, right? Is it just PR? Maybe. But has something shifted also? Yes, right? And I think what we've got to do is to be able to say, okay, they have their self-interested, maybe cynical motives for hopping on a PR bandwagon. But now that they're on record saying this stuff, we have open permission to hold them to account and to say, that's great. I love that you held up that placard. I love NFL that you now say that you were wrong to, um, to, to you know, ice out Colin Kaepernick. But now what are you doing, right? Yeah. Now what are you doing? What are you doing next, right? And, um, and I think that requires the persistence you're talking about. Um, but the second thing that I want to say is um, on a certain level, this time may be different and maybe this time everything will be magically solved. But to be very honest, I doubt it. And I think part of what we've got to be able to do as grown-ups of whatever age, I mean, you could be a grown-up citizen, you know, a, a single digit age, uh, understanding, you know, how to deal with things. As grown-up members of civic life, we've got to recognize that this is a multi-generational relay race, cool. right? Um, the people in the 1960s, you know, you, you said there are some people saying, hey, we thought this whole movement was supposed to get things done in the 60s. Well. I mean, from the vantage point of today, yeah, maybe the 60s didn't fix everything. But the, from the vantage point of the 1930s, the 60s sure did change the world, right? And that vantage point is important because many of the people and organizations that came to fruition during the 60s were, were, were beginning to do their foundation laying in the 30s, that it was a multi-decade commitment of litigation, of defense, of, you know, creating... Uh, media moments of trying to get public attention, of mobilizing faith communities, of getting people to, you know, and with every step forward, there was a half step or more backward. And then you push another step forward and then you have to go backward. That is the nature of politics in a democracy when you are not in the majority, particularly, right? And so we have to recognize that um, it is quite likely that this moment we're in right now will not lead to nirvana. But it is also quite likely that we, if we push and sustain and commit to not just activism, but to literacy and power, getting ourselves trained up and schooled in how to convert protest into institutional change, um, that we can actually move things, uh, not just incrementally, but make a great leap right now, right? I do think this is a moment of a great leap. And uh, when you look at the evolution of every social movement in the United States, um, you know, there's a famous line, 
uh, I think Ernest Hemingway said uh, once about how he went bankrupt, uh, which was gradually, then suddenly, right? Uh, and you can say the same thing in a positive way about how social change happens. Gradually, 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 frustrating, seems like nothing's happening, and then suddenly, right? I don't know if we're in the suddenly moment, but we're definitely not just in the normal or gradually moment either. And I think if we come together and train together, um, we can um, you know, hold ourselves and hold our society to account. Yeah. You know, and the other thing that I, I when I speak particularly to, to, to crowds, it's we have to be critical thinkers. We have to, you know, we have to have that three-year-old in us and ask why, 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 because that is what's going to generate why are systems the way they are? Mm. What, who created them? Why do they stay the same? How do you change them? Where are the levers of change? You know, what, I worked in the Department of Commerce uh, and I led an organization there for minority businesses. And my biggest thing was, who created this FICO score? Who oversees the FICO score? Who manages that algorithm? Why, is, why are there only three agencies that create the FICO score? I mean, think about it. Which, which committee of Congress oversees that? That is one of the things that continues in terms of capital flowing to minority businesses. And, and, and I'm incensed sometimes. And, you know, again, it just boils my blood. It's like we need to start asking those questions and asking, especially now that people are running for, for office, ask the question, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, this PPP loan that, was supposed to go for, for COVID. You know, why some banks made over a billion dollars on fees alone? It's like, you have to ask the questions. Critical thinking is important, especially in a, in a, for a population that wants to be engaged. And I know it's, it's hard. There's a question that I just want to answer, which is how exhausting this is, right? This work is not for the faint of heart. That's why the folks who are on this, on this webinar, uh, our, our troopers. This is hard work, but you know what? I wake up every day and it's like, let's go at it because the fight is so, the, the, what's over the horizon is so promising. And that's my, that's what I keep true. That's the trust. The, the trust is the promise that what's on the, over the horizon is a better tomorrow. And I hold on to that. That brings the spring and under my feet every single day. And we celebrate the wins during these conversations, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, you know the, the, the thing about um, that sense of the childlike question, um, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. Um, one of the things that we often talk to, you know, people just about how to deal with understanding power just in the context of your family life, right? Like this doesn't require a political science degree or a, even a civics textbook. You and a child can go walking through your neighborhood and just everywhere you look, ask the question, why? why? Why is it that there's no healthy food options where we live? Why is it that this abandoned lot has been abandoned for this long? Why is it that um, there's no bus service here, right? And if you, you know, as adults, you're just like, that's the world we're in. Like, I, you know, I got to deal with that. But if you actually put on that kind of childlike lens and ask, why is this, right? Mm -hmm. it, all those questions flow into one that I think is pretty central in what you were saying, and we often describe this as the core question of all civic power, which is who decides? Who, who decides, right? So you're asking, who decided that a FICO score should even matter this much, much less what goes into a FICO score? Mm -hmm. Who decides what the terms of the PPP loan are? Who decides um, you know, what forms of policing ought to be handled by uniformed officers and what forms can be handled by social workers and, uh, and others? You know, who decides uh, what a police department's budget ought to be, right? Th th these are questions that are alive right now. Um, and if you, again, if you want to make that pivot from protest and anger about the brokenness of our systems to actually changing those systems, you've got to have a laser focus on the question, who decides? And once you focus on that, you start peeling apart an entire map of power, right? Because the first layer of the answer is, oh, okay, on the question of uh, police funding, I see that the city council decides. Well, who decides within the city council? Well, I see that there's a committee within the city council. Okay, well, who decides within that committee? Well, here's this person who's either the big obstacle or the big champion of this, okay? Well, who do they listen to? Well, they listen to community members and business leaders. 
well, who do they listen to, right? And you just keep on drilling down on the question, who decides? And it's one of these beautiful things that the deeper you drill down on that question, the more you realize the answer in large measure comes back to you. You, you, decide. you decide. You, by awakening a bunch of other people, shape what that city council member is going to do or not do. You determine, you know, whether we consider it okay for the next round of PPP loans uh, to keep going to multinational giant corporations and banks. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you decide that by how you show up or not show up, right? And I think that's true across all different dimensions of civic power issues. Uh, uh, but I think when we come back to this focus on uh, race and racial justice and racial inequity, um, it becomes all the more important. Um, and, and I think our job right now um, is particularly in communities uh, where there is this long, long sense of a rigged game. Um, and you know, I see one of the questions here about white supremacy and its values built into the structures of our organizations. Um, part of what we've got to be able to do now is not only ask the question, who decides and how do we, uh, you know, how do you drill down on that, but then how do you change who decides? How do you write yourself into the answer, right? Um, and our, um, our task right now, particularly with young people and young people of color, I mean, it's what you're doing at the YWCA, it's what we're trying to do in our youth programming at Citizen University, is to bring, you know, history's most diverse generation of Americans ever um, into the fold of exercising civic power, um, getting them habits early on of feeling like they can be part of the answer who decides uh, by participating and by practicing power. So there's a lot of, there's some questions as well. I wanted to um, go back to um, Eric. Some folks are saying in terms of, um, I, I want to reference, uh, Dion said, for those of us who see the need, the absolute necessity of it, we suffer if we fail to do this work. One who is conscious, who sees the violation of most basic human rights suffer every day if we are not addressing these injustices. Um, how, would you, how would you address this issue of when you see the need, you're seeing it every single day, you, you, you suffer it. And I'll just tell you a quick story. You know, I, I, I've been to the border, I've been to the detention camps, and I would go beyond the suffering. It haunts me to go to a place where you leave and you are haunted. Because even though when we know who decides, you know, you, you, you're, you, right now it feels like, what do you do, right? Supreme Court, is it, ju is it, the, the, is it Congress? Is it the executive branch? I mean, it feels so muddy. How do you stay true to this work in spite of all that's happening? What is, where's the light that brings us through the suffering and into that hope? And it, it feels a little bit like scripture, right? Mm -hmm how scripture gets you through the suffering, right? Um, so I'm just drawing, I'm trying to draw, where do I find the strength to get through the suffering? And this is a question from Dion and, and I wanna thank her for that because it's, yeah. it's deep, right? It is deep and you know, I, I think one the tendency in times like this um, is often to turn to a capital L leader um, to sustain us. And frankly, what has been very exciting about this movement, this moment, this Black Lives Matter time we're in right now, is that there, it, it is relatively capital L leaderless. Mm -hmm. um, and people are showing up in different ways to take responsibility themselves, right? And when I think about what it is that gives me light through something as haunting and um, com completely dispiriting as mm -hmm. going to the border and seeing those conditions and, and those detention centers, um, or even something as haunting, you know, I remember a year after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, um, I went to Canfield Street in Ferguson. I went to that intersection where his body had been on the ground for hours. And, and it was just a normal summer day. It was an August day, you know, in this uh, completely segregated um, city, that town that, you know, had the electrical lines and vans and billboards of a modern 20th, 21st century place but basically had the cultural norms of the Jim Crow era still, right? Um, and that too was incredibly dispiriting. And you'd be like, what's the point? Like, this is not gonna change, right? And what gives me hope through moments and encounters like that um, is actually, you know, you talk about scripture. I think about the words of somebody like Ella Baker, 
you know, uh, and you know, folks who don't know who Ella, ba people, you know, uh, you ought to know who Ella Baker is, yeah. uh, a, a great civil rights, um, a, you know, activist, um, and someone who always had kind of mixed feelings about the um, adulation that went to uh, Martin Luther King. Um, and she thought it's dangerous for a movement to kind of elevate one person like that. And she had a famous line that I always quote, which is, strong people don't need strong leaders, mm. right? And so our task is to strengthen ourselves as a people, That's right? Yeah. The corollary to that is a weak people do need strong leaders, right? When people do not have the capacity to question, to do the critical thinking, to really push one layer yeah. deeper, yeah. then we just default to the, to the guy who rides in and says, I'm going to fix it all for you. Or the guy who says, I'm going to come in and make promises I can't keep. Right. But you're like, oh, that's great. I love that. He's got that. And it's usually a he, right? Mm -hmm. He's got that. Um, and so strong people don't need strong leaders. I think about people like Clara Looper, right? Um, another unsung, relatively unsung civil rights hero and activist in Oklahoma City um, who um, helped birth the first student sit-in movement uh, in, in the country. Um, but, you know, she's not in history books. Um, and yet what she did to stitch together young people and to bring pressure to bear on local businesses in that incredibly segregated town then um, gives me light because those times were much harder than our times today. Yeah. Those times were much more unforgiving than our times today. And people like Ella Baker, people like Clara Looper, people before them still managed to show up. Yeah. And it's literally the least we can do now to honor their work. Uh, when we've got so much more opportunity. So, you know, so, someone I think Sterling here uh, in the chat points out that one difference between today's uh, activists uh, and the 60s is that there's multi-generational support for today's activists. There are people uh, older um, who are actually showing up and changing their minds and wanting to help them. Um, that wasn't the case so much in the 60s, right? That was, there was much more of a generation gap in the 60s. Now there's an awakening, a great civic awakening as we put it, um, that crosses age lines. And so we have all these assets in this moment. Um, and I don't, I'm not Pollyanna. I know how bad it is at the border. I know how bad it is um, on death row in Alabama. Uh, yeah. if you think about our friend Brian Stevenson and what mm -hmm. he and his team persist in doing with the Equal Justice Initiative, right? Um, I know how, ba how bad it is still um, in Ferguson, Missouri today, yeah. uh, six years later, right? Um, uh, and yet uh, we can still, by building power together, make ourselves a stronger people. Um, and you're absolutely right. That requires a measure of belief in each other. Um, and you do that not just by saying it, you do that by doing stuff together, right? Breaking bread, having fun, you know, singing, whatever. Like, let's do stuff together. And then when the hard stuff comes, we'll have built some of that muscle to do some of the hard stuff together, too. My grandmother used to say, in the proximity comes the trust. When you are prox when you're, you're together is when you, when you, um, when you build a trust. And, and I, uh, I do have to say, because I, I, I grew up reading The Little Prince, and it's chapter 23, um, <laughs> and I invite people to read it. And it's the, it's the chapter that talks about trust. And trust is when I know that you're going to come at the same time every day, when the sun will be shining over your hair. It's a beautiful chapter because trust is, I know you're going to show up for me. I don't have to tell you to show up for me. I know it instinctively. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it's, it's poetic in so many ways, but I, I bring it down because even children's book, talk about trust. And I think we all have to go back. We've talked about that three-year-old. And sometimes I realize maybe we have to go back to that three-year-old, to that innocence phase when we instinctively trusted, because that's the only way we're going to bring back to community. There's a, there's a comment from Jeffrey um, on, the, on the chat uh, and the Q&A, and, and he references the, the report. And he says that the report doesn't necessarily say that there's a lack of competency, but that in fact, um, uh, trust factors that rank higher than competency. You know, and I, I would say, Jeffrey, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're right. It's just that when I saw the graph, um, uh, uh, no, NGOs did not show up on the other side of the of the um, of the axis where it, it had competency. So that was my my interpretation. Um, but I, I do feel that at a minimum, NGOs we do stand uh, much taller because in in terms of the rest of the sector because at least we have a level of ethics and we haven't talked about ethics. 
What does that mean? To hold true to what you, to do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. And even when it's not convenient, even when it doesn't make you money, even when it's fis fiscally not possible, when nobody else wants to show up and, and pay for it. We've been doing racial justice for a long time. And let me tell you, we, we've been doing it through sheer determination. Now we're seeing some dollars coming in. But before, it's, it's, it's through conviction. And that's ethics. Yeah. As you said, um, uh, Eric, at the beginning, it's well, the belief of, of your convictions. You know, we have this um, mock equation that we sometimes use to talk about citizenship broadly defined, which is power plus character equals citizenship, mm -hmm. uh, which means, you know, to live like a citizen, again, whatever your documentation status, to be a member of the body who's contributing effectively, you have to both be literate in power and understand some of what we've been talking about in terms of who decides and how do you write yourself into that story. But also you've got to couple that literacy and power with a grounding in character. What you're talking about is ethics. And we don't mean individual virtue or personal ethics. We mean character in the collective. Character. How do you live in public? How do you live in a community? Yeah. How do you, what do you owe your grandmother? What do you owe people you know, around you, your neighbors? And how do you hold uh, you know, a, a sense of mutuality um, in that community together? And um, you know, the program that I referenced earlier that, we've, that we're developing now called Civic Confirmation is all about the ethical formation uh, of young people in this time right now. Um, not in some abstract, you know, reading Plato or something like that, but taking the raw material of what's going on in the world right now um, on racial justice, on climate justice, on, you know, all different kinds of issues that are a front and center in the hearts and minds of, um, of young people right now. Um, and drawing out of those, not just the kind of either the excitement or the anger that these issues provoke, but actually drawing out those deeper questions you're, you're raising about character, ethics. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to do for others? How are you willing to put service before self? Um, and uh, and those, are, um, you know, those are things that uh, you know, we've got to cultivate. Uh, they don't just happen magically. Correct. We, and not just in young people, we've got to cultivate it. You know, <laughs> everybody who's not wearing a mask today needs a bit of that cultivation that it's not just about you, right? Uh, that, that we're in a society together. Um, and so not a day passes when we don't get an opportunity to practice power and cultivate character and civic life. And if we do that, then I think we can uh, build trust in this way. I'm hopeful. Me too. And I'm, I'm just fired up by talking to you. <laughs> really, um, Thank the, the you. Beginning of a great partnership, Alejandro. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.